don't leave. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today as we kick off our AIDS Education Month starting June 1st, which is today, and we're kicking off our HIV Prevention and Education Summit. So thank you for taking the time to spend a few um, the month with us. If you register, we have a plethora of webinars um, that will provide insight, education, awareness, and all of that. So be sure to check out our website and look through all of the webinars that we have scheduled for you this month. So this year, our theme is called it takes, it takes a Village, Building Community and Health Advocacy. That theme was decided upon because as most of you know, we have been navigating through this pandemic and we had to depend on building community to get our needs met for ourselves, for our families, for our children. We had to advocate, advocate for our health and all of that. And so this theme for this year's summit will speak to that. And so I'm excited to also have Jane Shaw with me, who is the CEO of Philadelphia Fight. Hello, Jane, and welcome. Good morning. Thank you. And so before we get started, I would like to first acknowledge our sponsors this year who um, support, who continues to support us each year for our summit, and they were a big support this year. And so our sponsors include Avvi, Viv, Coordinated Care Network Pharmacy, the Wistar Institute, Gilead, Walgreens and LabCorp. Thank you so much to our sponsors to make this year's Prevention Summit possible. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you all to Jane Scholl. Oh, thank you, Tashina. I'm gonna like show you all some slides. I, I think that, you know, we really have a great theme. Um, this year, um, in terms of supporting advocacy and and it takes a village. So I'm going to talk to you about the history. Um, let's see. Yes, let's see if I can get this up about the history of the AIDS epidemic um, and how it relates to fight and kind of get us to, as it were. Um, the modern world here. So this picture here is a picture of the AIDS quilt. Um, this is from a few years ago, but you know, it's sort of a magnitude picture that, you know, there, there's like a tremendous amount has happened. A lot of people have died. Um, we want to kind of recommit here. So we're part of a story. And we're part of a story about a terrible epidemic that seemed to come out of nowhere. And a small group of people who refused to lay down and die changed the world. Um, they changed the world, at least for people with HIV and to some extent with healthcare, um, because, because they would not lay down and die. They felt that they were consumers, you know, not patients, not only patients, consumers, and consumers have rights. And advocates, and then as you know, some of these pictures are about. Um, activists. And FIGHT has been part of it when we've provided HIV care, and also I want to talk about research when it was not available to all, but also through our education and, and especially Project TEACH, especially in the early days, although our education has broadened since then, we were part of it. So, you know, things are different now. But some of us do remember how in the 1980s, people would die within weeks of diagnosis. There was absolutely no treatment. That meant there was no hope. Um, young people were dying. And, you know, these are just some pictures from the 1980s. There was no end in sight. Um, and also, we have to remember there was no support, really, from the federal government. And remember who was president at the time, Ronald Reagan was president. And, you know, those of us who some people on this on this um, webinar, you know, who've been around long enough, um, probably remember that it was something like five years before Ronald Reagan actually even said the word AIDS. So, you know, this was an AIDS hospice picture from 1982. 
um, people felt that they had been left alone to die. And at that time, the gay community felt the need to create their own services because the traditional social service agencies really wouldn't help. Hospitals didn't want to treat HIV. This, you know, was, they kind of caught on in New York before Philadelphia, but for a very long time in Philadelphia, all the hospitals felt they didn't want to be known as the AIDS hospital because they thought people would just disappear. Funeral directors wouldn't accept bodies. I sort of put this picture in a lot of slideshows. It's a picture of Oliver Bear, the funeral director, because they were one of the exceptions. They would accept and they would do a funeral for people who would die from AIDS. And of course, as you know, it got so bad that often families turned away. So there were a lot of things that people did about social services and treatment, but the major early response was treatment activism. So there was enormous, enormous community pressure to search for the cure. It affected middle-class and professional gay men um, I'm going to talk about, you know, people who were left out, but I think the one thing that's just important to remember is that middle class and professional people, besides the fact that they had access to resources, and there were a lot of artists who were involved, a lot of people who you know, were, you know, in some way involved in theater, and they knew how to do things that were dramatic and have, you know, really good posters and all, this was the 80s, right, there was no internet, um, they also felt entitled, and I think that actually ended up working in favor of people with HIV because it was like, what do you mean this happens to us? Because it was it's very rare for a disease to appear to target an entitled, young, educated, conscious group. So that happened. And a lot of this treatment activism was around drugs in the bodies. And this is kind of what it looked like. There's also a lot of video, but you know, people demonstrating, um, one of these pictures right in the middle was, um, was a demonstration that happened at the National Institutes of Health campus um, where people, this one may have been the early 90s, felt like the first drug, the first drug that was approved, which was AZT, was poisoning them, was making it worse. It turned out that they were right. Um, one of the things that was interesting about this is that the, the community that really caught on first was African Americans who stepped back and looked at what they were seeing. And as a result, many people did, did by not being believed, even though we know they were right now. Um, I mean, I think we kind of knew they were right then. Um, but the result was a, there's a lot of suspicion and there were people left out of this, of this activism. Um, there was never a time in Philadelphia when white people were the majority of AIDS cases. But, you know, David Fair, who founded, was the, was the original director of ACO, the AIDS Activities Coordinating Office, used to say at the time, always simpler for the system if somebody died in a homeless shelter or not in a hospital. And a lot of people of color were dying in homeless shelters. HIV also was spreading through injection drug use. And there was a national problem with this. It was years before the Centers for Disease Control were willing to acknowledge this that is that that was a, you know, a, a route for transmission. Many of the people who got infected were people of color. There were definitely people in New York, doctors and other healthcare professionals in New York who were trying to get this point across. And when the CDC investigators were visiting their hospitals, they literally would refuse to go and, and visit and see the people in the hospital who'd been infected through drug use because they didn't believe it. Um, because of that lack of recognition, what followed was a lack of knowledge in, in many communities, because if you know the, the establishment, which people had plenty of reason not to trust, wasn't saying anything about it, you know, this is going to just make it worse. So I just want to digress for one slide. We're seeing the same story again with COVID as I think everybody who's on this call probably knows. People who had no economic choice except to take risks were the most vulnerable to COVID, meaning frontline workers in healthcare, but frontline workers in food service and transportation, people who are working in um, nursing homes and, you know, and so on. We have been doing testing, um, COVID testing all over the city. We've probably done close to 20,000 tests. And one of the things that we absolutely know as a result of this is that if you were lower income, you probably were living in more crowded housing. It was as a practical matter, you couldn't isolate, you couldn't isolate. Even if you had uh, a roof over your head, um, and of course there were the homeless shelters. 
So, and we've seen hundreds, maybe more now, people in this position. So, you know, this is the same story that just repeats itself. Um, the treatment activism succeeded over time. But in the early 1990s, we were founded in 1990. It hadn't yet succeeded. This is a picture of Tony Fauci, probably you know, from a few years ago, slightly younger. But he, you know, Tony Fauci was like a young guy at the time, um, probably one of the premier um, researchers. Um, even then, he was the head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. Um, the emphasis is, was still in those days on gay white men. Um, but, this, but an epidemic was occurring in Black and Latinx communities. There was not enough research that was open also to women and the people of color. And it was deliberate. That was what um, the drug companies wanted. They wanted people in a study who were as much alike as possible, and as opposed to wanting people in studies that would actually go across the whole spectrum and you'd be able to figure out hopefully over time, you know, if there were differences in how some of these drugs work. Um, now, also at this time, being able to get into a clinical trial could easily be the difference between life and death. If there are no effective drugs, the only drugs are somewhere in the pipeline, you want to be able to get into a clinical trial and they need to be widely available. But when fight started, clinical, they were not, they were not. So fight was formed really in response to these conditions that research needed to be available every place, not just in a few places. There was a belief, and this was not just local, this was national, and it was how we were able to get funded from national money. If local major institutions would not sponsor research for the reason that I said before, then there was a belief, okay, then doctors in the community would. And our first grants was from the American Foundation for AIDS Research, which was a grant that was always described by AMFAR and later by us at doctors in the community get banding together to do studies that major hospital systems would not do. We, however, also added a different kind of activism, which was the involvement of people living with HIV. And by that, we kind of meant all people living with HIV. So this is a picture from years later. But John Bell and ACT UP members um, at a protest, and I don't actually know what protest it was, but it involved coffins and it involved pills. And, you know, this was, you know, part of the ACT UP history of doing stuff that's dramatic enough that people will actually pay attention. Our goal was always to end the AIDS epidemic in the lifetime of people living with AIDS now, obviously, sadly, tragically, and in some case, to some degree, maybe unnecessarily, that didn't work for many of the people living with HIV or AIDS at the time. Our other goal was to equalize access to clinical research. Clinical, me clinical research means research in people, not as opposed to basic science, bench research, where um, it's not putting drugs into people. And we wanted everybody to benefit. I had a lot of reasons for coming to fight this, you know, but one of them at the time in 1991 was that I felt that it would be too easy to just evolve back into what was generally what you know, kind of everybody did. And if there wasn't somebody at fight who was really absolutely committed that women were going to get access to trials and that people of color were going to get access to trials, it wasn't trials, it would not happen. And we recognized right from the beginning that AIDS was the result, the AIDS epidemic, I should say. AIDS is a virus, but the epidemic was caused, was the result of longstanding um, social conditions, which also needed to be addressed. And, and, and if you weren't going to do that, then there was not going to be a way to end this epidemic, something which I think we have seen. This is a community advisory board for the Wistar Fight Pen um, HIV Cure Initiative. And I want to talk about Wistar because I think that there's been a lot of activism around AIDS, and I'm going to talk about the other kinds of activism and how we supported it. But that was also true true um, of the Wistar Institute. Um, we've worked with them since 1995. At the very first meeting we had at Wistar, which John Lax, who the La our Lax Center is named after, was present. John Turner, who was the person who founded, Dr. John Turner, who founded um, 
who founded Philadelphia Fight and various other people, John Lacks challenged the research. They had all these researchers lined up because everybody has a lab at Worcester. They were very excited that maybe we'd you know, be able to find the people who'd be willing to give them blood for their basic science because we were way, way before research and people at that stage. And John Locke says to them, well, what's in it for us? Why should we do it? And the people from Worcester had never heard anything like that before. And I heard about this later from Luis Montaner, who's on the left here, um, that they were kind of taken aback. They didn't know what to do about this. But to their credit, they thought, well, you know, he has a point. And since that time, not only Dr. Montaner, but he has certainly been the leader in this, but other people at Worcester have, in fact, thought about, you know, how can we translate this research into things that will benefit people with HIV early? So we kind of dragged Worcester into clinical research, what they had never done before. And that was activism, but it was activism that was also responded to. But another thing is that the first time Dr. Montaner met with some of our patients, this the first meeting, the LAC Center didn't really exist. But then a couple of years later, he started meeting with people who were our clients, who were our patients. And he said, well, what are you interested in? And they said to him, most people said to him, well, we want to know about the impact of substance abuse on HIV. HIV. And so there's been a certain amount of work on this, or had been, on the, the uh, impact of drugs, you know, differential. But he never forgot. Luis Montaner never forgot. And more than 20 years later, this partnership between Fight and Wistar published some of the first data on viral reservoirs, that is places where the virus hides when it's not in the blood, um, in the presence of substance abuse. And it turned out that the instinct that our that our patients had was right there's a difference so you know there's activism comes kind of in many flavors this is a picture um of Luis Montaner and me and um Dr. Francois Barre Sanusi who was a virologist in the 1980s working at the Pasteur Institute with Luke Montaner and you know there was a big dispute about who had really um discovered the HIV virus, that is Robert Gallo in the United States and Luc Montaigne um, in Paris. From our point of view, it was clearly the people in Paris and it happened you know, a couple of years before Gallo discovered it, but that's kind of neither here nor that, uh, here nor there. The other important thing that we learned when um, Dr. Barre was here and talking to us is she was a treatment activist um, from the first days of the AIDS epidemic. And she spent time and she traveled to different countries to try to get research when there was nothing but research to get access for, and then later to get drugs into people. So, you know, there's a lot of treatment activism every place. We also, taking up our story about fight, recognized that mass incarceration was a driver of HIV. Um, so I just want to tell you a little anecdote. Um, Mike Spence was a gynecologist and the army um, sent him to medical school. And um, after that, it meant that he had a commitment to the army while the Vietnam War was still going on in the 1970s. And he actually volunteered to go to Thailand um, as a response to that war. And there's like a whole story, but it, but it kind of doesn't matter. So Mike, even though he was a gynecologist, the army didn't care about specialties, was just put in charge of the general health of something say th around 3,200 people. And in that group of 3,200 people, there was 33 or 3,400 incidents of STDs a month, a month. Um, and Mike did a little study about it. He went down to, you know, where where the sex workers were in, in the community, where the town where he was, and he tested them all for gonorrhea, and he found out they all had gonorrhea, and he cured them, but of course it was only going to be temporary, and then it was going to start up again. Now, Thailand was an early epicenter of the HIV epidemic, and at the time I first heard this story from Mike, which was, you know, in, in the 1990s, I was thinking, wow, what a bullet got dodged in this country. Supposing that AIDS had happened about four years earlier, suppose the United States hadn't left 
1975, but it hung around till 1981. You would have had all these soldiers and they would have gone home and they would have spread HIV not knowing they had it to their sexual contacts. But then a couple of years later, what I realized is it did happen. And it happened because of mass incarceration. What was going on in the 1980s and into the 90s was because information on where the HIV epidemic was not. And so people who were people of color who were incarcerated thought this was a disease of gay white men. They became infected in prison or jail. And, you know, my favorite other little anecdote on this is Wilson Good was mayor. And the reason we had condoms in the in the Philadelphia jails, jail, not prison, the first jail in the United States to have condom was Wilson Good got the prison board together and he said, well, how many people are going to have sex while they're incarcerated? And the prison board said all of them. And so Mayor Good said, if you can't go along with condoms in the jail, I want your resignation from the prison board. And he was going to appoint people who would. So people became infected in prison jail. And then they brought they brought HIV into the community upon release. There actually is research about this. This is not something that we're that we're making up. Um, and it is it is partly the reason why we had higher rates of HIV in minority communities. Our interest in mass incarceration, once we got involved, went also went beyond HIV. We formed ICJ in response to the massive crisis that incarceration has been to communities of color, particularly with the spread of infectious diseases, but you know, over time sort of moving out. And the idea now is that it's a reentry center to um, help returning citizens reintegrate into their communities. And the bottom picture is some um, from one of the art exhibits that ICJ has been doing annually of art made by prisoners. Um, we also were formed to advance treatment education. Project Teach was started in the mid 90s to help people living with HIV control their own care. AIDS Education Month, this is pictures of AIDS Education Month, was started in the later 1990s to bring knowledge to the community and also to provide a space for activists, consumers, providers, and I should have said local AIDS service organizations. I kept thinking I got to go back to the slide and fix it, but I didn't. So local AIDS service organizations to come together and learn from each other. Um, and then a little after that was when ICJ was formed. Um, these are some pictures from many years of AIDS Education Month, and we all look forward to a time when we're not going to just be doing this virtually. Um, in 1997, we opened the Jonathan Lacks Treatment Center. Um, our goal was to provide state-of-the-art HIV care without regard for ability to pay and offer to everyone. And what that meant was, remember, this was long before the Affordable Care Act, where the big impact um, on the need for HIV care was that Pennsylvania, a little belatedly, but did expand Medicaid access. That hadn't happened yet. So there were a lot of people who needed um, who needed care and who basically were uninsurable. And our commitment was we will take care of those people lifelong. Nobody else was doing that. Um, also, everybody who came to our treatment center had their own doctor or nurse practitioner, physician assistant. They had their own provider to guide their care and to know them and to, you know and so on and we would make appointments but we also allowed walk-ins we did what we could to make lax a safe and welcoming space for people with hiv and very rapidly we were the biggest practice in philadelphia and what was interesting is that we were told by everybody that it couldn't be done so you know i think one lesson about this is particularly for those of us who sort of try to have an activist mentality if somebody tells you it can't be done just do it anyway um, and, you know, it, it was it worked in 2013, we became an FQHC with the purpose of being able to offer care to people who were HIV negative, but at high risk due to social conditions. And since that time, first, we opened the John Bell Health Center, which was named after John Bell, who was a prison activist and an activist whose picture I showed you in terms of an AIDS demonstration slide a few slides ago, which, among other things, specifically reaches out to returning citizens. 
patients to say, hey, there's care. And then the Fight Family Dental Practice, which um, is a money loser for us, mostly because we provide a level of care that generally is not available to low-income people and that you can't get reimbursed. And we opened Fight Pediatrics and we continued with the YHEP Youth Clinic. Um, because our, you know, what, what we believe here is that that the social conditions that put people at risk for HIV, for hepatitis, for heart disease at a later point, because nobody talks to people about diet, you know, and et cetera, et cetera, or something that, you know, we know, we know how to work with people. And so we should, we should broaden it. So a theme on health, ad, a focus on health advocacy is a reaffirmation of our of our roots. We were born in advocacy, you know, people because of the name fight, you know, people would confuse us with ACT UP and we're not ACT UP. We're a service provider, but we were in step with ACT UP and we were, we always have been committed to the empowerment of people living with HIV and AIDS and their allies to control their own care. And we were born in the belief that without advocacy, the epidemic would not end, which I think, you know, is, is kind of being proven because there is advocacy with AIDS and we've been part of it. And we are moving sort of toward the end of the AIDS epidemic someday. Um, and we believe that people with AIDS can influence policy nationally and locally. And the feeder here has been Project Teach, where you have many people who've gone through Project Teach have gone on to do just that. Um, people like um, Wahida Shabazz L and Teresa Sullivan and, you know, a lot of other people um, have gone on to do that. And their, you know, their voices have been heard. We're part of uh, the Martin Delaney Collaborative. That's the pictures with uh, Wistar. I think that's the last picture with Wistar that I've already shown you. Searching for a cure along with the Wistar Institute and um, the University of Pennsylvania, because, you know, a lot has changed here. A lot has changed here, but we don't have a cure. If there's not a cure, then the epidemic is not over. Just um, um, preventing new infections is, is not enough. Um, it's important to remember that Barack Obama funded this project with $100 million, and I think he had another $100 million later, but I don't totally know the numbers, so I thought I'd leave it off the slide. There hasn't been much added since. And of course, there needs to be more more and more money for this because there's a tremendous amount of, of research that's actually going on that I think has you know already begun to make a difference. But again, we don't have a cure. And when people talk about the end of AIDS, it's important to listen to exactly what they're saying. If they're saying the end of new infections, which is certainly an important goal, that's not the end of AIDS. Um, we need to also remember as advocates that we have a lot of drugs available to us for treatment and PrEP. So I know for many of us, it doesn't feel this way because it's not kind of this way, but we are living in the rich, the relatively rich West and the global North. Those of the global South do not have our resources. Now, more people than ever are being treated. 73% of those with um, with HIV, according to the World Health Organization, worldwide are now being treated. And you have to remember that when they started collecting these statistics, it was more like 15%, and then it was 40%, and it's continued to rise. A lot of the reason it's continued to rise is activism. Paul Davis, very important figure in this, who was basically was living in Philadelphia, who I met in ACT UP, was one of the most important organizers. They created a huge amount of pressure around this issue. The Clinton Foundation, then the Bill Clinton's foundation, got involved in this, and they started to push. Um, the Gates Foundation then got involved, but all of them were responding to the activism. And then, you know, a big, uh, you know, a big change where you got to give people credit where it's due, regardless of what else they've done, is the PEPFAR was a program that was started by George Bush. And that was the beginning of getting access in Africa. And it's also important to know that Debbie Burks, who we kind of knew about, but you know, maybe most people didn't. Debbie Burks came to the White House to work on COVID 
But before that, she had been working on PEPFAR. And I think that she is the person who managed to get that number from 40 to 73% over the years in which she was doing it. And she actually, according to a memoir she just published, was kind of reluctant to go work on COVID because she thought she could succeed. Um, there were still eight or nine million people, however, without access to treatment. Most of them are in the global south. And we need to advocate for those still left behind. You don't want anybody left behind. And of course, I think as you all know, people who were undetectable, who've been treated and were undetectable, cannot spread HIV to other people regardless of what they do. Similarly, many who could benefit from PrEP, including in the US, don't receive it. Um, and on PrEP, AIDS is treatable, it's, but it's still important to prevent it. The US epidemic could, I think, could be ended as regards new infection if this country had the political will to address the real risk factors, which are social. They're not individual. Your risk is predictable by many things, including your race, your gender, your zip code. And we are seeing an epidemic at the intersections of AIDS and race and gender and stigma and incarceration and LGBTQ um, and, and et cetera. This all persists. So, I mean, what I think is that our role as part of the global village of people who are committed to ending the epidemic is to continue our advocacy with everybody um, to work together through alliances and organizations till we end this epidemic. This is kind of a very rapid race through history and our values and so on. Um, but I think that we also need to remember, so what is the village? So the village that we need to end this epidemic is local, but it must be joined with others um, around the globe. It includes scientists, and that was one point that I think it was just really important to make. Not all scientists, but there are scientists who do get it and who will work with people who are advocates, including the people at Wistar. It includes the AIDS service industry. That is certainly also working to end uh, the epidemic but it has to also include the village, includes people who were living with HIV, their voices have to be heard, and also people from the communities that are most effective. So another way of looking at this is it's, it's all of us. And, you know, we've, you know, I think the, the attention of all of us has been a little bit diverted over the last two and a half years. And, you know, if, if um, AIDS was shining a light, as people used to say all the time on in, in inequities, especially in health, obviously, COVID was shining strobe lights on this, and, and that's important. But we don't want to forget this epidemic is not gone, and we probably could get to zero in terms of new cases. And we probably, if we keep recommitting, I think we probably could get a cure. But it is not going to happen without advocacy. So that's what I have to say. So thank you for hanging in there and uh, listening. Thank you, Jane, for walking us down um, the history of fight, but also the history of how we begin to uh, connect with the Wistar Institute and the birthing of ICJ and our education department here at Philadelphia Fight. And so thank you for that wealth of knowledge. There were some things that um, I wasn't even aware of that I said here and um, really took in um, just the, his, the rich history that we have here at Philadelphia Fight. And for those of you who are watching, if you have any questions specific to um, what you heard today and um, from the information that Jane shared with us, um, please ask your questions in the Q&A box um, so that we can answer them as well. Um, but in the meantime, I want to also welcome you to register for the other webinars that we have for you throughout the month of June. Um, today, we have another webinar scheduled um, by ACO from the Philadelphia Department of Health. They will be presenting today at two o'clock, so be sure to register to hear from ACO. Let's see, do we have any questions? <laughs> 
no questions at the time. Jen, do you have any last words or any uh, thoughts you'd like to leave with our audience before we wrap up? Well, I, th I think, you know, the first, thank you all again for attending and, our, and you know, for um, for hanging in there because I think it's it's much harder when it's a, when it's at least for me um, when it when it's a Zoom meeting, but I think what's really important at this point in history is you know this epidemic has been going on for a very long time, and it's you know it's it's and and it's treatable right so it's it's easy for people to sort of you know like oh well you know that's something that's already dealt with. And it's not, and it's not. And, you know, it's like the first time I started hearing people saying, oh, well, you know, now it's treatable, it's already dealt with, really was the early 1990s. And like, here we are in 2022, and it's not. And, but that it, I believe it really is up to us to keep the attention on HIV, to broaden our perspective, which I think we have been doing, to remember that, you know, it's, it's racism and gender discrimination and poverty and so on that is to a very great extent what's keeping this going so it can't be a narrow focus on hiv it has to be the broader focus and we have to not give up Thank you, Jane, for that. I think what stuck out to me the most was the very end, um, which I think is the most important, is that it does take all of us. It does take all of us um, to come together to really um, address the needs of the community so that we can um, find a cure, come to a, a place where we can actually um, cure um, HIV and AIDS. And so it takes a village for sure. Um, there are two questions, or a question rather, that was posted for new employees who may be viewing um, this webinar. Um, can you provide the meaning of FIGHT, the acronym of FIGHT? It, yeah, it stands for Field Initiating Group for HIV trials, which I want to say I did not name this group, um, but that's that's what you know. There were, some, um, and actually at the time, so we created fight. Or some people who thought that was cute created the name fight, but right at the same time, there was a group that was similar to us that was called Combat in Los Angeles, and there there were a couple other ones that you know. So it was people felt like they were in a war. Um, we just say fight in part just because typing out, you know, field initiating group for HIV trials is like a little, um, kind of a little bit much, but, it, but that's, that's what it stands for. And of course, we don't only do HIV trials now. Hey, thank you. Um, there was a comment made in the box as well, Jane, just saying that uh, this is from Comar, that um, you're doing a great job at Philadelphia Fight. So thank you. Well, and thank you for saying that. If there are more questions, feel free to use the Q&A box. In the meantime, while I wait for questions, I again wanted to thank and acknowledge our sponsors, Obvi, Vive, the Coordinated Care Network Pharmacy, the Wistar Institute, Gilead, Walgreens, and LabCorp. Thank you again to our sponsors for this year's summit. So there aren't any other questions. So I would like to thank you all for attending um, and for sitting with us for the past hour, learning of the history of Philadelphia fight and why it's important to, um, it takes all of us, it takes a village to really solve some of the um, challenges we face in healthcare um, and, and also equity um, for all. And so thank you for watching and be sure to register for the webinar scheduled today at 2 p.m. with ACO. And check out our website at fight.org to look at all the other webinars that's also being offered for the remainder of June. Jane, thank you again. Thank you, um, thank you all. You guys have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.